We're going to get started in just a second, folks. We're Hi. With some there we go. Hi. Sorry about that. I um, am uh, welcome to everyone who's here. Um, we're delighted that you can join us for this presentation as part of the Redbud, uh, Grow with Redbud series that we're having this fall. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Redbud and our chapter. And then we'll get started. Um, I'm, I think I mentioned, I'm Jean Wilson. I'm president of the Redbud chapter. And I um, have had the privilege of working with this chapter for the past um, five years. Uh, it's a very um, busy group. And uh, let me, you, as you saw in the introductory slides, we're one of 35 chapters in the California Native Plant Society. Um, CMPS is a nonprofit with over 10,000 members um, that seeks to uh, preserve our state's amazing botanical heritage. With almost 8,000 native species, California is a world biological hotspot, one of only a few dozen. Nevada and Placer counties are themselves uh, biological hotspots in that we have um, approximately one-third of the California native plant species locate, that grow in our two counties. Um, this is likely due to our highly varied uh, topography, habitat, and plant communities. Shane Hannafy, um, our speaker today, um, will describe the plant communities of our two counties and will provide some really amazing vivid photos of many of the plants that grow here and the communities. The Redbud chapter has over 300 members and has actively protected and updated about our local native plants for more than 25 years. Um, we've led field trips. We have uh, presented educational programs like this one. We've published two comprehensive uh, field guides to native uh, California wildflowers, uh, trees and shrubs of our two counties. And, um, and more. Um, in addition, we also inform and educate through our newsletters, website, Facebook page, YouTube channel, and Instagram account. We work to conserve and advocate for native plants, including submitting written comments and speaking on environmental reviews at public meetings, um, as well as collaborating with other environmental organizations to take action in appropriate cases. We actively promote native plant propagation uh, and gardening and offer plant sales to make natives available. Redbud will have an online plant sale, native plant sale in early October. We're still working out the details to ensure the safety of volunteers and customers, to resolve some technological challenges we're running into, and to work out the logistics of getting plants to our customers. Stay tuned for more information, um, and we will be publishing a list of plants that will be available at the sale, um, hoping to post that on Facebook and the website sometime in the next week. Uh, we encourage you to become active in Redbud by attending programs, joining our Facebook group, volunteering to help with plant, the plant sale, writing articles for our newsletter, growing plants yourself, um, and... Um, joining a, a one of our many committees or running for office. There will be a lot more information about that uh, uh, and an opportunity to talk with you at our next Wednesday night member meeting, September 16th at 7, and there's more information about how to join that meeting online. Uh, just a couple notes about our upcoming events. We have, as I mentioned, the Redbud meeting on September 16th. On September 17th, and this is postponed because of the, um, the power outages that we have, but we will have um, the presentation by Leslie Warren, our advocacy chair, on putting into putting passion into action um, and advocating for what we love. Uh, it'll be a fascinating presentation. I hope you can join us next um, Thursday night, September 17th at 7 o'clock for that. On the 19th, which is Saturday at noon, Chrissy Freeman, a Master Gardener and Redbud member, will be presenting on what makes Native garden, Gardening special. And finally, on September 23rd, we have a fascinating presentation by uh, Nancy Names Gilbert on rainwater harvesting and rainscaping strategies for healthy watersca watersheds. 
So with the, I wanted to say just a minute more about today's presenter. Uh, we're really thrilled to have Shane Hannity speaking. He is um, uh, wears many hats, shall we say, for Redbud. He um, is our web editor in our social media chair and field trip committee chair and our plant sale co a plant sale co-chair and president-elect. And his real passion, however, is exploring, identifying, photographing, and discovering native plants. As you will see from his remarkable presentation, he excels in each of these endeavors. Shane, you're on. Great. Thank you for that introduction, Gene. Um, all right. I'm going to share my screen here, and we'll get going. All right. So, uh, thank you all for coming to my talk here about botanizing Nevada and Placer counties in 2020. And it, it, it's been an interesting year, hasn't it? Um, certainly, the plants have not stopped blooming. Um, they've not stopped growing anywhere. Uh, so, I got to explore quite a bit this year. Um, one of the only places I could really go out was in the woods. Um, getting away from people <laughs> and uh, exploring what we have to offer. And so I've got a lot of information I'm going to throw at you here. So I'm going to try to move relatively quickly and feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat. And we're just going to hold answering those questions till the end. But, you know, during the talk, you can go ahead and ask what you want. Our moderator will be taking note of them and will be uh, asking me them at the end. Okay, so here are Here's a list of our habitats in Nevada and Placer County. Um, we have a real varied amount of habitats, considering the fact that our area goes from the valley floor all the way up and over the crest of the Sierra into the east side. And uh, I just also want to point out that the distinction between these different habitats uh, is very blurry. So there's not a concrete line where, say, subalpine and alpine begins. There's a lot of microclimate, mi microhabitats, a lot of bleeding. Uh, certainly like riparian and aquatic habitats exist pretty much throughout all of this. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the habitats in general, give some of the common species that occur there, uh, dive into some of the uncommon and rare species. And of course I can't cover all of it, but um, in California we have, or in Nevada and Placer counties rather, we have approximately 3000 taxa of native plants. Uh, of which about 2,400 are native and 150 are rare. You'll notice these nice round numbers, and that's because this is entirely an estimate. Uh, the truth is we don't we don't know all of the plants that occur here. Um, this is based off of cow flora information. Um, some of those are misidentifications. Uh, some of those are not only rumored to occur here. So there's not a concrete number that we can base off of, and that's why exploring this area is just so rewarding because sometimes you find things that uh, no one else has ever found before. So uh, here's a list of some of the things that I carry with me when I'm going out botanizing. Uh, number one is my cell phone. I mean, I just, I can't express enough how lucky we are in this day and age to have the technological advances we have. Uh, you know, back in the day, you'd have to carry 30, 40 pounds of camera equipment into the field and carry notebooks and field guides and, and, and water and food. I mean, just a lot of weight. And uh, now a lot of that stuff I can just carry in my pocket in my cell phone. Um, and I carry a clip-on lens, which uh, I don't know if it's showing you the video of me at all, but uh, this is the little clip-on lens here. It just snaps right on the top of my phone, allows me to take really close-up photographs. And so a lot of the plants need really detailed descriptions to be able to identify and this uh, helps me take pictures so that I can post it on say iNaturalist or something like that and get confirmations of my IDs. Um, another thing I carry is a hand lens. So the clip-on lens is, is really good for documenting those details but the hand lens is really good for just being able to tell for myself um, what I'm looking at, you know, whether these ha hairs are glandular or not, for instance. Uh, I always carry a notebook with me and that's helpful for jotting down uh, habitat notes, uh, location notes, um, especially if I'm going to be making a collection, it's really important to uh, take pretty copious notes 
Um, I'll admit that I don't really refer to my notebooks again that often, uh, at least 90% of it. But if you take the notes, uh, at least you have them. So if, if nothing else, you can refer back to it. Um, I carry a ruler with me. Um, I actually triple up on my rulers. So I have my, uh, you know, your standard ruler. I have a ruler app on my phone, which is really helpful. Just in case I happen to forget it, I can uh, use the app on my phone. And But if I do want to take pictures with the plants that show the sizes of them, then that really doesn't help because um, my phone is also my camera. And then I also carry a little, um, this is like an old rewards card for a grocery store. And I just added some masking tape to it and uh, wrote out the millimeter measurements so I can use this, keep it in my wallet. I pretty much always have my wallet with me. And this way, if I do forget my larger ruler, I at least have some backup uh, collection bags. And I try not to collect a lot of plants. But every once in a while, the curiosity gets the best of me. I want to take it back to my microscope. I want to figure out exactly what I'm looking at. And so collection bags are just, you know, the gallon Ziploc bag. And the plants will keep in those bags. You can take them home, throw them in the fridge. They'll keep for a couple of days until you get a chance to put it underneath the scope. And there are certain groups of plants that you absolutely need a microscope to be able to identify. Um, the Like for the popcorn flowers, for instance, there's not a whole lot I can do in the field. So. Uh, it helps to have some bags. And um, I use two apps um, and websites, I guess, uh, iNaturalist and Calflora. The beauty of these sites is, you know, you would have to, at one point in time, you would have to chronicle all of your explorations, write it down in a notebook, uh, take a lot of notes, uh, write down uh, general location information. Well, I can use these two apps to take pictures in the field and know exactly what location I'm at. I can go back in time and look through my old observations and I can learn a bit about the timing of the plant. You know, what did I see in this place last year? Uh, or for that matter, what did other people see in this place that I'm going to that I've never been to before? And uh, iNaturalist is generally for any living organism. So I will post uh, not only plants, but insects and fungi I'm really interested in. So those go up on iNaturalist and Calflora is pretty much just for the plants. And I try to double up because they're both really great databases. And, um, you know, I feel really strongly that it's important to flesh out those databases and add as much information as possible. And lastly, if I have room in my bags and I feel like um, taking them with me, I'll bring my field guides. Uh, my two red bud field guides certainly help a lot in Nevada and Placer counties. Uh, every once in a while, I'll lug around my Jepson manual, but um, I also have an ebook version of that on my phone. So, Lately, I haven't been taking the Jepson manual out nearly as much. Um, and yeah, they're just, they're really good to have in case there's something that you know you've seen before, but it's just kind of slipping your mind and you, you want to know right then and there what you're looking at. Uh, but certainly, you know, field guides due to the nature of, of print, barring the Jepson manual, I guess, which is an enormous book, uh, they're limited. So, you know, our field guides contain a fraction of the plants that you can actually find in this area. And I want to warn against just using a field guide and comparing it against pictures because you know, especially at a family level, a lot of plants look alike. And so if you're looking at a carrot family plant um, in the field guide, you know, you'll see several that kind of look alike and you really need to tease into the details to figure out what you're, uh, what you're looking at there. All right. So we're going to move to our first habitat type um, grasslands. So uh, this is primarily found in the most uh, western part of our county. It's generally really flat. Uh, there is a marked lack of trees here. Um, it's pretty much all herbaceous, some wildflowers, and then certainly native and more and more non-native grasses are taking over these areas. And there's not a whole lot of grassland habitat in our counties to explore because a lot of this is being developed, um, turned into tract housing, turned into agricultural land. Um, it's sort of disappearing at an alarming rate. Uh, and some of the, you know, one of the only tree for the most part, at least outside of the riparian areas that you'll find are the valley oaks. Uh, they can, you know, it's that stereotypical California scene of a grassland with a big arching oak in the middle of the field. Um, and some of the herbs, uh, lupins, poppies, some paintbrushes, and then of course various bulbs, which we'll get into in a second here. Uh, so here, this slide shows the diversity in the mediae. These are the tar weeds and, the, and their allies. 
Um, you know, this includes genera like Media, Hemizanella, Centromedia, Calcadenia, and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's a lot, quite a lot of diversity in these late blooming flowers that are typically found at, uh, well, I'll, I'll say the greatest diversity is at lower elevations, but certainly they, um, they exist going up into higher elevations. And these are members of the sunflower family. You can tell by their composite flowers. So you have uh, ray flowers, which actually each one of these is an individual flower, and then you have disc flowers in the center. Uh, each one of these little bits is an individual flower, and combined, uh, it's known as a composite flower. That's something that's characteristic of everything in the sunflower family. And so most of them are yellow. There are uh, some color variations as well, and a lot of uh, variation in the size, in the shape of the ray flowers. Um, and another thing that's really common in this group is that they, and where the name tarweed comes from, is they're often covered in these glandular hairs that are very sticky. Uh, a lot of them are really aromatic. Um, so yeah, that's where the name comes from. Uh, here uh, is a group of plants from Orobanchiaceae. This is the uh, broomrape family. Uh, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure most, if not all, of the plants in this family are uh, partial parasites. So they uh, tap into the roots of nearby plants and derive some of their nutrition from um, it, often in the grasslands from just grasses and other herbaceous plants. And uh, we have two genera represented here, Castilea and Trifocaria. Um, Trifocaria has just one pollen sac on each anther and Castilea will have two. So that's how you can tell them apart, at least through a key. And, you know, obviously to tell that information, you need a hand lens at the very least. A uh, microscope makes it a lot easier because, you know, these plants are very often very small. Um, but I think they're quite beautiful. You can see the on the right side, the Trifocaria Ariantha uh, is largely lacking in chlorophyll. So uh, it does contain some on its lower branches, but uh, something you see very often in these um, partially parasitic plants is that they will be lacking um, green coloration and unable to make their own food. Uh, here we go with, a, here's a bunch of plants that grow kind of in, uh, in groups and stands and really nice colors uh, from bird's eye gilia, uh, cream cups in the poppy family, uh, popcorn flowers and California poppies and uh, red maids, which is in Montiaceae and related to miner's lettuce. And here's two plants that uh, that show up in our grasslands quite often. We have Blenospermum nanum, the glue seed, which is named such because the pollen is actually encased in a very viscous, sticky liquid, and I believe the seeds as well. Um, and I'm not sure what the purpose of that is. My guess would be that it sort of prevents predation, and stops the animals and insects and stuff from eating uh, the fruits and the pollen, and increases their reproductive potential. And on the right, we have Plantago erecta. This is the California plantain. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the invasive English plantain, which grows in my garden, certainly, uh, and very widespread. And then there's another non-native uh, Plantago major, I think, uh, the common plantain. But this one is a native, and it's got quite a small stature, beautiful translucent uh, inflorescence there. It's really gorgeous if you get a chance to look at it up close. And it's a really important pollinator plant. There's um, a couple of species of butterflies that only lay their eggs on this plant, their, their host plant. So um, pretty important one to have around. And here's a bit about our geophyte diversity. So geophytes are plants that grow from a bulb or a corm that is buried in the soil. And they usually send out what's called a feeder leaf. Um, and it's, you know, it, it basically collects energy from the sun and stores it down in this bulb or this corm. And if it gets, once it gets big enough, once it has enough energy, it will put up a flowering stalk. And then you get these beautiful, beautiful ornate uh, flowers from it. So a couple that are included here are the dicolostoma. So we have uh, the snake lily and you have the wild hyacinth over here. Uh, snake lily I enjoy a lot because um, it climbs up like the fences in my yard and just wraps itself around. It can get six feet tall or more on the, on one flowering stalk. Um, and then the artist formerly known as Dicolostoma over here, this is blue dicks. Uh, now it's included in the genus Dipterostemon. Uh, 
So they moved it. They determined it's genetically and, for that matter, morphologically distinct enough to warrant uh, moving it to a new genus. And we have a couple Brodia here. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out when you're identifying, when you are seeking to identify Brodia, is you really want to pay attention to these like pointy white bits near the tepals here. See all those? Um, that's going to really aid you in determining what you're looking at. You know, this one right here, Brodia elegans, has its, and these are called staminodes, by the way. Um, the staminodes are away from the center of the flower, more closer to the tepals. And tepals is just a combined word for petals and sepals that are pretty much indistinguishable. So really this flower here has th uh, three petals and three sepals, but they're um, pretty much indistinguishable. So the term for that is tepal. Uh, this one over here is Brodia nana, and it has its staminodes in the center of the flower, and then they kind of curve out, and then the margins are enrolled a little bit. And over here is a rare species of Brodia. This is Brodia sierra, and this one has its staminodes uh, in the center as well, but they are not reflexed out. They're not curved back, um, but the margins are still enrolled. And this one, the Brodia sierra, is much larger than uh, Brodia nana, which you, know, you find in vernal pools occasionally. And speaking of vernal pools, and before I get going on this, I do want to thank Hannah Kang for providing me with the photographs for this uh, section. I was able to visit vernal pools this year, but I was much too early to get uh, beautiful photographs that would represent these well. And so uh, Hannah was kind enough to share some of the photographs she took this year so that um, we can show off some of the beauty of this rapidly disappearing um, habitat type. So uh, vernal pools are characterized as being uh, depressions with hard pan bottoms. So water will collect throughout the winter and slowly evaporate or dissipate. Um, and so you end up with these concentric rings of plants as the water, as the water evaporates. So the ones in the center of the vernal pool can deal with being submerged early on in their lives and can deal with their roots being wet kind of later on. And the ones on the outside of the ring, like a little bit more dry. Uh, soils, but you know, obviously they're still getting some water. And you get a high degree of endemism in this area through uh, this very specialized habitat type. You know, most of the plants that grow here are annuals, so they will grow quickly, they will flower, they will drop their seed, and those seeds will remain dormant in the soil banks um, until the rains return and then they start growing again. And a uh, really interesting thing about vernal pools is they're working on a process of being able to take a soil sample from vernal pools and actually analyzing the DNA within the seed bank um, so that you can survey vernal pools and tell the species assemblages year round and you're not limited to like this very narrow window of time where they're actually in bloom and identifiable. And so some of the herbs that you find here are downingia, uh, quill warts, popcorn flowers, meadow foams, uh, gold fields, that sort of thing. And so as I said earlier, California's vernal pools are becoming uh, less frequent uh, over time. Uh, it's estimated that less than 10% remain of its former, of, it, of how much used to be here. And they're being threatened by development, by agriculture, uh, by altered hydrology. So essentially uh, where the water used to pool up, it's now being drained out for agriculture and, um, you know, for, uh, from by wells and things like that. And uh, there's many, rare plants and animals in this habitat. So it's uh, very concerning that um, they're continuing to be developed. Certainly in Placer County, we are trying to protect some of the last vernal pool habitat in our two counties uh, where they're proposing to put the Placer Ranch project. Um, and tune into Leslie's talk uh, on the 17th if you want to learn more about that. So here are two plants that like to grow kind of early on. And they obviously, as you can see from the pictures, they don't mind being submerged, at least partially. Uh, on the left, we have a button celery. This is actually in the carrot family, APACA. Uh, it makes these really beautiful stands of uh, very stark, pointy uh, flowers and foliage. And uh, on the right side, we have flowering quillwort, a name such because it actually it looks like a, a true quillwort, but this one actually produces flowers at the tips of those leaves. And so it's actually a flowering plant and not a quillwort, which is a, a fern ally, but more on that in a minute. Uh, here we have sort of opposite ends of the spectrum as far as uh, ornateness goes. <laughs> we have Downingia bicornata, um, beautiful 
member of the bellflower family in Campanulaceae. And uh, these do grow elsewhere, like even up to higher elevations, but usually you'll find them in the drying margins of uh, bodies of water, um, of which vernal pools is sort of a micro version of that. And then we have Eleocharis macrostachia, the uh, pale spike rush. The, the rushes and the sedges are integral, really important parts of pretty much every habitat type, and they don't get quite enough love for my liking. Uh, they're so so gorgeous to look at up close, and um, if you can see in this picture, those little uh, white filaments that are coming out are the female uh, flowers. That's the, the stigma poking out there, and very diverse. There's tons of species of, of rushes and of sedges, and um, a lot of them are, are really gorgeous, too, if you get to look at them up close. You know, from when they're not in flower, they just kind of look like normal grasses. Um, all right, so here we are going to compare two. Well, we're going to compare uh, uh, we're going to compare a fern to a fern ally. So on the left is Isoetes natalii. Uh, this is a fern ally um, in its own order, Isoetales. And then on the other side we have a pillwort. Uh, and the difference between these is in the venation of the the leaves there. So they both kind of look like nondescript grasses a little bit growing from these corms in the ground. Uh, the quillwort will have what's known as a microfill. And so that's basically where each leaf just has a single vein coming up from it. And then the pillworts actually have a macrofill, which uh, the best example of a macrofill is like, think of your standard uh, fern frond, and it has these branching dichotomous veins as many veins. And that's the truth with the uh, pugularia here. Um, so they actually have multiple veins in there, and it's a true fern. Uh, it doesn't have the frond that most that we usually associate with ferns, um, but for whatever reason, it's just evolved beyond the need for, uh, you know, for a big, sprawling fern frond. All right, we're going to move up a little bit into the blue oak wood woodland. And, you know, this habitat type for, forms a bathtub ring around the Central Valley. You can find... Uh, the typical assemblage, which is blue oak and gray pine uh, on the eastern part of the coast ranges um, and then all the way around the the Great Valley, pretty much. And uh, all of a sudden, as you're climbing an elevation, you'll see a lot more trees and shrubs. Um, so it's moving on from the grasslands. And you'll occasionally find some other trees mixed in there, like interior live oak. Uh, certainly shrubs start showing up, like coyote brush and red buds. And uh, mariposa lilies, some more tarweed, coyote mint, um, and one of my favorites, Douglas violet, is uh, they start to show up. Here we have two kinds of mistletoe with very different strategies. On the left, we have the pine dwarf mistletoe, and on the left, the American mistletoe. The pine mistletoe, as you might have guessed, grows on pine trees and, and, and a couple other conifers, and the American mistletoe grows on oaks. Um, so they are both parasitic plants. They send out what's called a historia. It's a little, it's basically a modified root that taps into the vascular system of their host plant. And it will take, uh, water, certainly. I mean, if you don't have roots in the ground, how else are you going to get water except for taking it from your host plant? And, um, especially in the case of the dwarf mistletoe, which lacks chlorophyll entirely, it's also taking, uh, nutrients and carbohydrates and things like that. And, uh, the dwarf mistletoe is really interesting because it has fruits which explode um, and it sprays their, their seeds out and uh, covered in a visky substance that sticks to the bark and it will then germinate and tunnel into the plant. And then the American mistletoe is primarily spread by birds. So they have uh, berries that the birds absolutely relish. And uh, on top of that, a nice little clump of mistletoe, especially when there's no other leaves on the plant, provides really good nesting habitat. So mistletoes are really important wildlife plants. Uh, I, I know a lot of people don't like mistletoes and they want to remove them, uh, citing that it's going to harm the tree. And it does parasitize the tree. And it, I guess, ultimately harms the tree, but it kind of works on a time scale that really shouldn't matter to us. You know, it's, it, it takes so long for it to spread and really harm the tree uh, that I don't recommend spending the energy and removing it and depriving the birds of uh, food and habitat. And so, yeah, so the birds will take the American mistletoe berries and eat the berries, fly off, and then deposit the seed on a branch with a nice little packet of fertilizer. 
which uh, allows it to germinate, tunnel into the host plant. And um, often you'll see some oak trees that are just absolutely covered in mistletoe. And that's a sure sign that the birds really like that tree for one reason or, the, or another. All right, so we're moving on to a plant in the uh, cucumber family. So we have native members of the cucumber family. Uh, this is Marifabacea. It's one of our two Marif species that we have here. Um, it gets these really beautiful white flowers, which you can see on the left, and eventually produces these green spiky fruits on the right. And then I thought I'd include in the center a, um, an example of one that was fasciated. So uh, usually, and you can see in the other pictures, it's got relatively rounded stem with these ridges on it. And this one had a genetic mishap or uh, had a disease or something like that, which caused the growing end to flare out and create a nice fat um, stem there. It's really, really interesting. And that's uh, something that can happen in a, a whole bunch of different kinds of plants that we would have around here. Uh, here's our other Mara that you would see around here. It's the tall man root. Um, on the left, you can see the, the bell-shaped um, part of the flower behind the petals. That's one of the identifying factors. The other one uh, has what's called radial flower, so it lacks that uh, that curved bell-shaped part. It's just pretty much flat. And then you can see it also has an inferior ovary. So the fruit is developing behind the flower and it eventually turns into what we see on the right side, which is a lot less spiky. There are a few spikes on there, but certainly not nearly as coated as the other one. And uh, these beautiful dark green veins running throughout it, kind of making it look like a, like a Tim Burton-esque pumpkin or something like that. Uh, here's uh, two Tritolea species. I'm going to point out a little bit about the differences between these two. Um, they typically, the Tritolea lacks of the Wally baskets or ethereal spear is another name that's used for it. Uh, grows a little lower down. Uh, Bridges brodia um, grows a little higher up, but there is a quite a large area that they overlap. So what you want to pay attention to is first and foremost, the blue pollen on the uh, Tritolea bridges EI is pretty distinct. And, you know, you can see that that's lacked over here on Wally baskets. And then it might be a little difficult to make out in these photographs, but all of these stamens are attached at the same level on the Bridges Brodia. So they're all right where the, um, the Corolla like flares out here. They're all attached right at that point. And then over here, you can see one's point, one's attached at that point, And then every other one is attached a couple millimeters lower. And so they kind of alternate in the level that they, uh, that they grow at. And uh, a more unreliable is the general um, petal shape here, or the, the people shape rather. And also this white ring that occurs around the corolla on most Tritolia bridges EI. And I might also add that the common name is still bridges brodia because this used to be included in brodia and it has now moved to Tritolia. Uh, however, the common names don't get updated. So still, still called bridges brodia. All right, two really interesting members of the Asteraceae family, which are, in fact, much more beautiful when they're in fruit. So these are the seeds, and these, like, papery bits on the end here are called the pappus, and this is what helps members of the sunflower family get spread by the, by the wind and, uh, yeah, helps disperse their, their seeds. And when they're in flower, they're sort of nondescript little yellow flowers um, that are actually kind of hard to identify, but once the pappus are visible, it leaves little doubt. Uh, the blow wives here has these rounded edges on the pappus, and then silver puffs has these nice little points. So it helps you tell those two apart. And here we have another um, partial parasitic plant. This is uh, Warrior's Plume, Particularis densiflora. Really nice stand of it found here. Um, this one is tapping into the roots of shrubs, typically manzanita. Um, and probably some other ones too. I imagine Toyin, uh, you see it a lot in these blue oak woodlands kind of on the borders of shrubs or in the shade. And because they're partially parasitic, they don't need full sun to make all of their food. They can just take a little bit of the, um, of the energy from their host plants. And uh, I should note too, that we are anticipating a name change for this. So Pedicularis densiflora is soon going to be primarily the coastal um, genetics of this plant, and we're going to get a new name for our CRN1, uh, Particularis orientiacus. I think I'm pronouncing that right anyway. Okay, gabbro. Uh, gabbro soil. So um, if you've ever been to 
like McCourtney Road in Nevada County, uh, going down Wolf Mountain Road, you'll, you'll see a really good instance of gabbro soils for our area. These are ultra mafic soils that are high in magnesium and iron and heavy metals, and they're low in calcium and essential nutrients. And so essentially, if you are a plant and you want to grow on gabbro, you have to be adapted. You have to be really tough. Um, you have to be able to deal with basically having no nutrition, having to deal with the heavy metals. Um, you have to deal with really harsh, dry, rocky habitat types. And so you get an assemblage of some plants which um, will grow off of gabbro soils, but are have the adaptations necessary to be able to survive there. And also uh, plants which are exclusive to gabbro soils. Uh, and so it's pretty much dominated by shrubs. You get manzanitas and ceanothus, uh, chaparral peas, one of my favorite that you'll find on the gabbro soils around here. Uh, you will get some trees, but uh, often they're dwarfed because of the soil chemistry. And um, two herbs that are exclusive to gabbro soil, uh, bolanders, mule's ears, and the chaparral sedge, when chaparral sedge being a rare sedge. So this plant is one of my favorites that grows pretty much exclusively on gabbro soils. There are approximately 30 groves left of this in the world, although it is not technically a rare, it's not ranked as a rare plant. Um, the Grass Valley area contains about eight of those 30 groves. And this is one that's being threatened by development in the gabbro soils because plants don't really grow well there. It's kind of dismissed as being junk land, um, despite the fact that the plants there are just absolutely fascinating. And so this is a very highly aromatic, it kind of smells like turpentine almost when you walk past it, um, very aromatic tree that uh, is fire adapted. So uh, it needs fire to regenerate. These cones that are in the center here have resins on each of these, uh, the edges of all of these scales that when fire comes through, it um, melts the resin, it pops it open, and then seeds are scattered. And then once the, the older trees have been removed and you have this nice open habitat, it will, uh, you'll get lots of little sprouts coming up. I actually, I visited the campfire scar this year up in paradise where they have a, a grove of this and not a single adult tree survived the campfire. They were completely burnt out, but everywhere you look, there were little baby McNabb cypress growing. So uh, it's just a way of ushering in the new generation. And then all the way on the, um, on the right, you can see, some of the resin glands where some of that aromatic smell comes from. All right, so this is an issue I could probably talk a really long time about, so I'm gonna just uh, keep it brief. Um, we have Fremontodendron in <laughs> Nevada County, and uh, we don't exactly know what species we have. Um, if you were to try to key these out, it would kind of come halfway between uh, the much, the very common Fremontodendron californicum and the rare pine hill flannel bush, the Fremontodendron uh, decumbens. And um, we are undergoing, we're, we're just about to start genetic testing on this to figure out what we have. You know, is it uh, one or the other species? Is it, a, is it a hybrid? Is it a new species? Is it a, um, technically a subspecies or a variety of one of those two existing ones? Um, so, you know, stay tuned to our channels and um, we'll release news about that as we get it. But yeah, very interesting, beautiful plants. Those flowers are just stunning. Um, yeah. Okay. Another plant which uh, I, I don't believe is restricted to gabbro, but certainly in our area it seems to be. I've never seen it anywhere else besides gabbro soils. We have Hartwig's doll lily, a really beautiful monocot. It's kind of uh, easy to confuse with like soap plant or uh, maybe a death camas or something like that, another other white flowered monocots, but um, these claw-like flower parts and these reflexed petals pretty much give it away. Very, very beautiful lily. Well, related to lilies anyway. Okay, so this is uh, Calcesia stebensii, the Stebbins Morning Glory. This is a very rare plant. Um, it only grows uh, on gabbro soils. It only grows in our area, kind of in the Mc McCourtney Road vicinity, and there are some populations in the Pine Hill area of El Dorado County. And so it's uh, pretty easy to overlook because it has these pretty standard morning glory flowers. But if you look at the leaves here, these leaves are utterly distinct. They're almost hand-shaped, right? These little fingers coming off. Um, and so this is another fire adapted plant. It really cannot deal with any competition whatsoever. And so it will, during the time where it has an open habitat, 
it will flower over and over again. It will drop its seed into the soil bank. And then eventually the shrubs will come in and overtake it and it will no longer grow. But then fire will come through and remove the shrubs. And then when you have this bare mineral soil, all of those seeds in the seed bank will germinate and grow again. There's, uh, we did some controlled burn uh, experiments in the McCourtney Road area. And in that scar, hundreds of these came up. Um, so it's, uh, it just, it needs fire to clear out. And unfortunately, the only problem that we're facing now is the tendency for in cleared habitats for invasive species to move in and outcompete this plant even though fire has moved in, the, the invasive species basically prevent it from coming back far ahead of its normal succession. All right, low elevation chaparral. Um, so this sort of overlaps with the gabbro soil. We could definitely consider gabbro habitats to be low elevation chaparral, but um, it's not exclusive to just that soil type. So um, I wanted to include a little section uh, of plants which you know don't necessarily rely on the gabbro soil to exist. Um, again, very shrub-based. You have manzanita, cyanothus, toyon, coffee berry, and some of the herbs would be one of our native St. John, John worts, um, gold wire, and you know, some lower elevation pensimon species. Uh, here's a good uh, comparison picture of two Arctosaphilus species, two manzanita species that are fairly common in our area. The one on the right is certainly much more common. Um, but the uh, Indian manzanita, I, I suspect, is more common than we than we think, and it's just the fact that you need to pretty much examine the flowers in order to tell what you have, and they look pretty darn similar when there are no flowers. And so what you want to notice here is on the, um, the pedestals here, um, there are these leafy bracts coming off above each of the flower stalks, right? And then on the visita, it pretty much lacks those. There are bracts, but they're not real leafy. They're not like sticking out too much. Um, they're more oppressed to um, the flowering stem there. And certainly there's differences in the fruits as well. This is uh, Visida as well with these smaller red colored fruits and our, uh, Miwaka has much larger, almost chocolate brown colored. Um, and uh, another reason why these get misidentified often is because in the Jepson key, the very first key break is about whether uh, the manzanitas have a burl or not. And so a burl is just, it's pretty much an expanded stem at the soil surface, which allows the plant to re-sprout after fire. So fire will burn off the above ground growth and it'll regrow from the burl. Uh, and it mentions that um, it, the common subspecies of Miwaka does have a burl, although the ones near us most of the time do not have a burl. So uh, I don't know exactly what's going on there or why the key is so unreliable. Um, but certainly if you go off of the flowers and the fruit differences, uh, Miwaka uh, is, and it's Miwaka subspecies Miwaka. There's a rare one, Miwaka subspecies Truii, um, which I don't think occurs here, or if it has, I've never heard of it occurring here. Um, and yeah, that one is, that one is the one that's supposed to not have a burl, but apparently most of them don't have a burl. Um, I have seen Miwaka's with a burl in El Dorado County though. So um, I'm sure that that has to do with the type specimen and what was initially described as being Miwaka. Okay, Ceanothus. Uh, here's two common Ceanothus of these low chaparral areas. We have the buckbrush and lemon Ceanothus. Um, besides the different colored flowers, certainly the growth form is very different um, with buckbrush getting quite big as long as it's not being eaten down by deer and Lemonii staying, oh, three feet tall or something pretty much just a shrub. Uh, and then also if they're not flowering and you're not sure what you have, you can examine the leaves where lemon seed, uh, lemon seed has much thinner leaves and uh, buckbrush has much more leathery thick leaves. And lemon seed will also have these uh, gland tipped tooth, uh, teeth rather along the, the edge and buckbrush, it will be entire or, you know, it won't, it will lack teeth. Okay, here's uh, Fraser albicollis, a beautiful, beautiful uh, relative of the monument plants and uh, grows in nice stands in the chaparral area, wherever it can open up, it will grow often with like Sonoma sage and um, penstemons and things like that. And uh, just, uh, I included it mainly because I think it's just stunningly beautiful uh, with these, you know, with the stamens sticking way out, you have these nice green nectaries on the petals and really ornate blue spots on all of the petals here. 
Uh, oh, and then another thing, which you can't really tell from this picture, but all of the leaves, the margins of the leaves are this brilliant silvery white color, and the rest of the leaf is, is your kind of standard green color. Um, so you can even tell these when they're not flowering that uh, they have white stem frost right there. Probably the most beautiful leaf margin in the California plant kingdom. Uh, okay, two uh, mint family plants of the chaparral. We have Sonoma sage, um, which is a creeping, a creeping aromatic plant that sends up these beautiful flower stalks with these really um, ornate flowers with the exerted flower parts here. Um, they almost look like little little insects or something stuck in the flowers. And uh, pitcher sage over here, which is uh, a shrub and uh, leaves out really early in the year. Smells absolutely wonderful. It has these awesome uh, bell-shaped flowers. Okay, lower conifer belt. Um, this is where I live in Grass Valley. Um, probably most of us uh, live in Grass Valley or Nevada City if you're in uh, Nevada County. And so this is, uh, this is the habitat that we currently occupy. Um, so it's uh, known for a lot more tree diversity, uh, a lot less sun um, than the lower elevations. Uh, and so you'll get things like ponderosa pine, black oak, incense cedar, Pacific Madrone, Douglas fir, and uh, some shrubs like the gooseberries, um, beaked hazelnut, or mountain misery, like you could see on the right side there. All right, here's a, a, an assemblage of the Orchidaceae of conifer forests. So um, I'm sort of in love with the orchids. I, I, I pretty much have an obsession with anything that is mycoheterotrophic, which is a word to describe the fact that they are reliant on soil fungi in order to get their, um, to germinate their seeds and to get, um, to get their nutrients. Uh, certainly the ones that are lacking any green pigments are utterly relying on those fungi. And so I'm going to start from the right side and move my way over. Uh, this is, these are two different Piperia species. Um, and they start off by sending these really rounded, like it's two leaves that come out and the underside is really silvery. They're really gorgeous. And when you're wanting to tell them apart, you really want to look at this part of the flower right here, which is called the spur. And so this is the flat spurred Piperia that uh, it, obviously it's a flat spur there. And then these curved ones with the really dense flowers is the dense flower Piperia. So <laughs> pretty easy to tell apart there if you uh, know what to look for. Um, this is probably our most common orchid in the area. This is Goodyera blongifolia. It's the um, rattlesnake orchid. It's an evergreen with these beautiful marbled leaves, um, stunning to see in the wintertime. It creates really nice colonies, and out of the center of that rosette will send up uh, some almost um, nondescript orchid flowers, at least compared to most of the other orchids that we see. Um, and it blooms in, in late July, August or so. So you have to be kind of lucky to see it if you're a, uh, like me and try to avoid the heat as much as possible. Uh, here we have um, some selections of coral roots. So this is the striped coral root right here. Notice the stripes on the petals and the spotted coral root. Notice the spot on the petals. And uh, this one over here, this yellow one without any spots is also a spotted coral root. Um, so it's not necessary that they be red. It's not necessary that they have spots. Uh, what you really want to be looking at are the veins on this upper petal right here. So you can count one, two, three veins. That puts it squarely in Corallariza maculata. We, ha we do have a rare yellow coral root, um, Corallariza trifida, uh, and that would just have a single vein on this uh, upper petal there. So, um, yeah, color morph. Liliaceae of conifer forests. Uh, we have the the rare in general, not so rare around us, Lilium Humboldtii, the Humboldt lily, a lily of dry areas with these beautiful two-toned peoples here with the spots and the really long flower parts. We have and two Fritillaria species, the scarlet uh, Fritillaria with its beautiful checkerboarded uh, coloration here, and brown bells, which uh, is much more common than Recurva um, and just really gorgeous ornate petals as well. These kind of look a bit, uh, a lot less bright colored, let's just put it that way. All right, this is uh, one awesome phenomena that I became aware of this year, the tendency for our Calicordus species to hybridize. And so on the left side, you have Calicordus albus, and on the right side, you have Calicordus monophyllus. 
and here is the hybrid. And so uh, you can see they're sort of halfway in between, like you have bright white, bright yellow, and sort of this light yellow color. Um, you have the dangling flowers of Albus and the upwards facing flowers of Monophyllus. And these ones are kind of in between. Um, and same with the size. So uh, the Albus can get to a foot and a half, 18 inches tall or so. And Monophyllus stays relatively close to the ground, six inches max. And this is about a foot. So um, pretty much intermediate all the way around. Uh, showy milkweed, one of our beautiful native milkweeds. Um, I hope everyone is familiar with milkweeds. I will talk a bit about the pollination strategy where in between each of these petals here is a little slit. And that will actually, when the insects come to feed on the nectar and whatnot, uh, their leg will fall into that slit. They'll get stuck there and they'll struggle all around a whole bunch. And then um, the plant will deposit what's known as a pollinia onto the insect. And a pollinia is just, if you think of pollen as like those individual pollen grains that you're used to, uh, a pollinia is like a congregated sack of pollen. Um, and so it's made of multiple pollen grains uh, and it gets attached right to the insect. Um, milkweeds do this and also orchids do this. And as far as I know, those are the only two groups that actually produce pollinia. And uh, yeah, so the insects, as they're stuck in the flower, Sometimes you have predator insects that take advantage of that. And so here we have a crab spider um, attacking an invasive European honeybee, uh, which is stuck in the flower here and absolutely helpless. All right. Acerum hartwegii, our wild ginger. Uh, I really, really enjoy this plant. Um, it, it produces its flowers underneath the leaves right along the ground. And these flowers are actually, it's made up of, it doesn't have any petals. These are actually sepals, um, typically three here. And it has this nice deep red coloration and it smells like rotting flesh. And that's because this plant is pollinated by flies, which would norm normally look for like a, um, you know, like a rotting carcass or something like that to lay their eggs in or to visit. They're attracted by the smell and that, that color. And this plant kind of tricks those a little bit. Um, and most often you will find it in, in this form right here, very green, but some very occasionally you can find it brilliantly marbled like this. Um, and it's quite a treat to see. I included this picture over here because it kind of looks like a little shop of horrors, you know, feed me Seymour guy, which I like a lot. And then I also found a really weird one this year that had four sepals. So a little, little mutant. Okay. Serpentine. Um, Serpentine is another ultramafic. It's very much like gabbro, uh, but the serpentine rock is technically softer uh, than gabbro rock. And I'm sure there's other chemical differences that I'm just not aware of. And uh, again, there's a range of plants which can exist off of serpentine, but also manage to survive on serpentine. And a good example of that is like California Bay. Um, and then there's certain plants which only grow on serpentine and uh, one of the really interesting things is how this unique soil chemistry really leads to speciation, at least the new species uh, being formed over evolutionary time. And uh, you get a lot that are just exclusive. Um, and so like there's a serpentine fern, Aspidotus densa, for instance, which is not exclusive to it, even though, but it's so often found on serpentine that they gave it that common name and uh, an indicator. So this is one that I'm, I'm pretty sure can be found off of serpentine soils, but pretty much every serpentine outcrop in our area will contain a small population. Um, this is in the borage family, uh, California Gromwell with the Spermum californicum, and uh, worth including mainly because yellow flowers in the borage family, at least in our local borage uh, family plants, is, is pretty rare. So if you see something with a scorpioid flower and yellow petals, maybe start with the lithospermum. That, that's probably what you got here. All right, and so on the uh, left here, we have an endemic uh, plant to serpentine soils. This is an indicator species that if you find this jewel flower, you're on serpentine, um, almost guaranteed. It's got really beautiful uh, compressed flowers. Uh, these are the petals right here with a wavy margin. Um, and I mean, the stamens are just utterly bizarre. So, and jewel flowers are, are extremely diverse. They're really susceptible to speciating, in, especially in um, different habitat types and different substrates. And uh, we have several rare species, although around us, we have two species, and one of those species has uh, two subspecies, one of which is rare. Uh, and then on the other side, we have Xerophon lily, Elethronium 
uh, erythronium multiscopidium. And this one is found broadly in the lower elevations of our county, but it can tolerate serpentine. Um, you'll often find it in the chaparral too, growing underneath the shrub. And it's just got these really gorgeous marbled, like leopard skin feeder leaves there. Um, here's one which I'm not sure whether this is exclusive to serpentine, but I've only ever seen it on serpentine and only in seeps on certain uh, serpentine areas. So it needs uh, water as well. This is Hoida orbicularis, the round leaf leather root. And it's a really interesting member of the pea family because the leaves look like a large leathery clover, but the flowers look like a, like a weird lupin, right? So um, common pea family characteristics that uh, come together. Um, this beautiful plant here is the shorthorn steer's head. Um, as far as I know, exclusive to serpentine, uh, Dicentra possiflora. Uh, steer's head is probably one of the best common names I've ever heard. It's like actually descriptive of the plant here. It kind of looks like a steer's head with its horns here. Uh, and this is in the poppy family. It grows on serpentine areas. You can see it on Drum Powerhouse Road. So moving on to the upper conifer belt. So you start to see a lot more firs, uh, a lot less oaks um, and true firs, I should say, abies and not, not necessarily pseudosuga. Uh, the Douglas fir. And uh, you start to get the lower elevations plants phasing out and you get the higher elevation plants starting to phase in as you move, um, well, technically if you move east. And so you'll get things like white fir and bitter cherry, green leaf manzanita starts to show up rather than white leaf uh, or miwaka. Uh, and then poke knotweed is a one you see very often in this area growing on the roadsides and, and other places. Uh, here's the bush tan oak. So this is Nothalithocarpus densiflorus, variety Echinoides, what a mouthful. Um, and we actually have both, uh, sub, uh, both, both varieties that uh, occur in our area. The other one is variety densiflorus. And the difference being that the Echinoides is in a bush form and the densiflorus is in a tree form. Uh, although the tree form is far more rare in our area, it's actually much, much more abundant along the coast. Um, but the Nothalithocarpus are oak relatives. Uh, and they produce little acorns and the caps of the acorns have these like pointed tubercles here. So uh, you can usually tell when you have, um, these are just forming by the way, uh, usually can tell when you have a tan oak rather than an oak. And over here, here are the flowers, um, the white flower spikes here and uh, called tan oak because the leaves contain elevated levels of tannic, tannins. Um, they were once used to like tan leather and other things like that. And it also, keeps them from breaking down a lot. So you get a really good uh, duff layer of tan oak leaves and a lot of like fungal species that are associated with the tan oak. And, you know, they're kind of cased in that, that duff layer there. Okay, uh, orchids, back to orchids. Um, we have the phantom orchid, uh, this beautiful white orchid, also known as a ghost orchid. Uh, typically you'd see, you know, one to five of these stalks, but, uh, Happened to find a group this year where there was like a hundred, there was like a hundred, 150 of these all coming out of the pine depth. It was absolutely magical. And they, if you ever get a chance to smell them, they smell wonderful. It's like pure vanilla extract, um, just really gorgeous um, native orchid. And on the other side, we have a rare orchid, the clustered lady slipper, uh, the lady, call it lady slipper because of this inflated lower lip here. Um, yeah, and this one, this one is rare and only known from a couple places in our counties. Uh, this is the fringe pine sap. It's in the monotropoid subfamily of the blueberry family, uh, Ericaceae. And it's a that whole group, the monotropes, are really fascinating because they are microheterotrophs. Um, so they basically are reliant on the soil fungi to get going. And so I got pictures of it through all of its life stages this year. When it first, uh, when it first emerges from the duff layer, when it's in flower here, and when it's producing its seed. And here we are to the, uh, everyone's favorite, uh, <laughs> the California pitcher plant, one of our two local um, carnivorous plants. Uh, another name for it is the California cobra lily because of this like lower bit right here kind of, and its growth form um, curved over like that makes it look like a cobra, I suppose. And these only grow in cold running seeps at the like mid to high elevation. So you actually need running water and you actually need that water to be cold 
in order for this to grow. And typically those environments are really low in nutrients. So you have plants like this that have developed carnivory as a strategy to, uh, you know, padding out its nu nutritive needs. And so what will happen is a bug will fly up and in this tube from the bottom here, and it will kind of fly around a little bit, realize that there's nothing here for it, fly up to the top. And then at the top of this, there are all these translucent see-through um, bits of uh, leaf that, like, have you ever seen a fly in your windowsill that's just bumping into the window over and over again? It basically um, is exploiting that same behavior. And so the fly will just bump up against the top of it, thinking, why can't I escape? Until it finally gets tired and it falls down to the bottom of the pitcher. And then there's a, a, a bit of liquid in the bottom, which is actually, um, which has a bunch of in, uh, bacteria, which release enzymes and it breaks down the insects. Uh, the bacteria takes a little bit of that nutrition for itself and most of it goes to the, the plant. So it's actually, there's no, not like an acid substance. So there's not anything that the plant is producing to actually break down uh, the insects. It's the uh, symbiotic relationship with the bacteria, much like our own gut microbiome. Uh, that provides the digestive abilities. And then over here, this is its beautiful flower, which is a really interesting flower. Um, I don't have any pictures really of the flower parts up close, but um, we actually don't know what pollinates the Darlingtonia. Um, but judging by its flower shape, it's probably a specialized uh, relationship because it's, it doesn't have a flower, flower parts that could be really utilized by any generalist insect. But uh, as of yet, uh, and maybe there's been new research on this, but I'm not aware of it. We don't know what pollinates those. Okay, more uh, monotropes. So this is another one in the blueberry family. This beautiful barber pole looking plant right here is uh, sugar stick, Allotropa vergata. Um, I mean, I'm just going to let the pictures speak for themselves about this one. It's just, it, I can't believe this is a real plant. Uh, <laughs> and it is existing off of um, tricholoma fungi in the soil. So um, specifically the matsutake. So, um, yeah, if you see Allotropa vergata growing, then if you go in the wintertime, you'll often find that choice edible fungi growing in the same place. And our beautiful, the only white lily of the Sierras, it's uh, Lilium Washingtonianum, uh, named for Martha Washington, not George, or not the state or D.C. or anything. Um, beautiful speckles in the center there, grows in dry areas. So if you have a dry uh, area, lily around us, it's usually Washingtonianum or Humboldtii if it's white or if it's orange. They're pretty easy to tell apart. Mm -hmm. And then here's just some, here's some random things here. Uh, uh, first of all, we have two Myanthemum species. We have Myanthemum stellatum and Myanthemum racemosum. Uh, not to mention the color variation on the, uh, on the berries here. There's also different flowering forms. So there's one berry on each penuncle here, one flower. And then on the racemosum, there's like each, you can see the berries have fallen off of this. There's like these little stems off the side. Um, there's multiple flowers on each one of those. Uh, so this is a raceme, this is a panicle. Uh, otherwise, if they're just vegetative, it's very hard to tell them apart. Um, here's a relatively uncommon flower called twin flower for very obvious reasons. Um, forms these nice rhizomatous mats in, it pretty much can deal with pretty deep shade, a uh, gorgeous plant to come across. Um, we have Tritalia ixioides, ixioides, which is the pretty face. And you might have seen this one before, but it is usually bright yellow in stark contrast to these uh, mid veins that are dark colored. I happen to find a bright white one this year. So very interesting one. Uh, parasitic plant, uh, a phylum purpureum, or uniflorum now, rather. Uh, so it's a one flower broom rape, and this is tapping into uh, the roots of other plants. Uh, it has no leaves at the bottom here. It just sends up this flowering stalk. It is really nice. Um, purple and yellow flowers, tubular flowers. Uh, we have the bear, beaver tail grass, the, uh, one of our beautiful ornate calicordis that grow in this area. We're, I was lucky enough to see quite an abundance of these this year. They're always a treat. Calicordis are uh, pretty stunning. And then another Erythronium species, one of the, uh, pretty much the, the only other one that grows in our area. Um, it's Erythronium purpureum. Uh, and it lacks that leopard spotting on the leaves and the flowers are purple tinged just ever so slightly, though that's not really reliable. Uh, and this one grows at higher elevations than the other one we were seeing. River canyons. Um, so river canyons have really, really interesting plants in them, which um, I'm going to show you some bangers here. Uh, but so you end up getting 
moisture and elevation gradients. You know, um, as you get closer to the water, you can have plants which grow directly in water, uh, ones that get a little higher uh, humidity levels, and then all the way up to the ridge tops where you can have, you know, rocky areas and uh, dry adapted plants. And then another thing to notice is the aspect or, or which direction the landform is facing is really important. So on the, um, like this side of the river Canyon is facing South. Uh, this will be hotter and drier. You'll get a lot more drought adapted plants. And then on the North facing side, you get a lot more shade. You might get thicker forest. Um, and certainly if you're going to go hiking in a river Canyon in the middle of summer, I recommend being on the South side. Uh, and some of the plants, which, you know, don't exclusively occur necessarily in river canyons, but I associate them with the river canyons are the um, California bay tree, mock orange, uh, bush monkey flower and silver bush lupin, which just looks so amazing together. And you can see like on the 49 crossing of the Uber River growing together. Uh, and then some vines like Dutchman's pipe and wild grape. Uh, here's uh, two of the succulents that grow in the river canyons, or typically in the river canyons, um, usually on rock faces or moss-covered rock faces. We have um, the broadleaf sedum right here, showing the quite wide leaves. And these are like, there's a little pup right here, and it'll send out, um, it'll basically crawl along the substrate and plant new plants. And on the other side, you can see it in flower. It's got these really beautiful yellow flowers. And then in the center is our, our only native Dudleya. The people on the coast and the, are so spoiled with their Dudleya diversity, but we get one at least. Uh, this is the canyon uh, live forever. And this is its flower stock right here. So here's another succulent. This one's a rare one. Uh, this is Cantalos lewisia, lewisia cantalovii. Again, same habitat, these moss covered, humid kind of rock outcrops, um, sawtoothed leaves. And then these beautiful candy stripe flowers. Uh, what you can't see in here is that that sawtooth pattern actually occurs on the sepals too, and it's really, really beautiful. And uh, this grows pretty much exclusively in river canyons, and it is uh, rapidly disappearing because people love to pick these. In fact, when I took these pictures on the trail in front of me were uh, three or four um, uh, Candelos lewisia that people had picked off of the rocks and just left to dry in the middle of the trail, which was very annoying. All right, so this is this is my big discovery from this year. Uh, another succulent. This is the uh, this is the Coast Range stone crop. Uh, first saw it on a hike back in March, maybe, and this is where I took the picture on the left here. And I was like, huh, that's strange. That's a weird looking sedum for this area. And you know, I ran through kind of what could it be? Is it a horticultural variety? You know, there's a lot of human history. Maybe somebody just brought a little, they, they planted it thinking they were doing a, a, a good deed or something like that. And, uh, you know, resolved myself to go back and see it when it was in flower because the key requires you to examine the flowers. And so I did go back in June and it was flowering and was able to get it to sedum radiatum, coast range stone crop. Obviously we don't live in the coast ranges. Uh, it's never been reported in as a rumor or otherwise in Nevada County. Uh, the closest it's been seen is the northwest corner of Butte County, and then also like near Lake Tahoe in El Dorado County. So this kind of this instance, this population basically splits those two directly in half, um, and it's seldom seen away from the coast. Uh, and so I was able to make a collection of this and press it and get it into an herbarium. So now this will be uh, officially reported from Nevada County. Uh, another great accomplishment was uh, finding a, a new population of this rare jewel flower. This is Streptanthus tortuosus trueii. Um, how it differs from subspecies tortuosus is in the sepals right here. So these are the petals, these really ornate um, lacy bits with the purple veins. These are the sepals right here. The sepals are actually longer than the petals in most instances anyway. And it has a very different growing habit and it was only known from a very, very small area in the middle Yuba Canyon. Um, it was collected kind of on both sides of the canyon and that the, the canyon acts as like a county line. So it was only known from Nevada County in that one spot and also Sierra County just across the river um, in the same exact spot. And then one day I was, I, I spent a, quite a lot of time browsing through iNaturalist and I saw in the unknown species section, someone had posted this jewel flower, which considering I was just out looking at the Streptanthus Truei um, in the middle canyon, I recognize instantly as being another uh, population of this 
however, in the South Yuba Canyon, so about 25, 30 miles away from the only known population. And so uh, I messaged that person on iNaturalist, uh, confirmed that their location information was accurate, and uh, went out with a small group of botanists and made a collection of it and officially um, extended the range of this rare jewel flower. So I think that's pretty cool. And another weird one for the river canyons, and like I said, the river canyons just have really bizarre plants growing in them, um, is this coastal disjunct deer fern. Um, this, this I did not make a collection of, although I'm going to have to go back because I found out after the fact that it was never reported from Nevada County. This is a fairly common fern on the coast, uh, and this is a river canyon at like 5,000 feet or something in Nevada County. Um, where I was able to find it growing. And this, uh, this river can, this is just to show the habitat of where it was growing. Really interesting place in general for plants. A lot of uh, ericaceous diversity happening here. And uh, just went down because we heard water. I went with my wife and um, just wanted to let the dog like, dip his feet in the water a little bit. And then just became so overwhelmed with the plants that we just took our shoes off and walked about two miles up river right through the center of the canyon there and um, documented everything we saw. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, some like low elevation uh, mountain ash and low elevation um, Sierra laurel and things like that uh, you typically associate with higher up, but they had made their way down into that river canyon. Um, so here's a couple of random things just quickly. One of my favorite monkey flowers, uh, Diplicus cologii, just uh, really gorgeous. Who doesn't love monkey flowers? So I wanted to include that one here. We have another aphylon. Um, we showed the purple one before. This one is the clustered broom rape. Uh, this specific one was growing on the roots of Facelia species, and uh, we know of, of someone who is currently teasing apart this group, um, Aphylon fasciculatum, and making the argument that it is actually several species, um, largely based on genetics and, and host, and in particular, the ones that grow on Facelia roots were sort of underseen, and so made a collection of this one as well, and got it into the records, and hopefully um, you'll be hearing more about that soon. And the center here is an albino bay tree. Uh, so here's the normal color of the, the bay. Found this little albino guy, bright white. Uh, and this is not long for this world. Um, it is basically surviving off of the uh, stored nutrition in its seed because it cannot make its own. I seriously doubt that it's connected to the roots of another one, like some of the albino redwoods that can get actually quite big. And so I was happy to see it in its very, very short time on Earth. All right, moving on, uh, we're at lava caps. And so this is kind of a misnomer because it's not actually made from lava, but volcanic mud flows, ancient mud flows that have been uh, weathered down over time. You get really interesting plants here. They're generally open rocky areas at ridge tops. And so you'll get some uh, chaparral overlap um, like manzanitas. You get really cool monkey flowers and clarkias and um, one that's very common on this is uh, the Pratton's buckwheat, which we will I will show some pictures of in a little bit here. Uh, another gorgeous monkey flower, the uh, pansy purple lip monkey flower, uh, grows in beautiful, beautiful stands of purple and black and yellow and white. And um, here's a color more version, a, a white version I was able to find too. And uh, these, are, it's hard to tell from the photographs, but they're very small. They're like maybe an inch or two tall. And so they, there's these low growing carpets of purple everywhere. It's uh, quite a sight to see. And then this uh, picture in the center is showing a health half acre, how the lava cap hard pan basically acts as like a sort of a vernal pool where you get these concentric rings of, of plants. You have the purple of monkey flower here. You have Navarretia, which I think is Navarretia intertexta here. And then eventually you get Media and uh, so you get these concentric rings. And this is just like a path um, going through the middle of the property there. So here's the areogonum, uh, Pratton's buckwheat, a beautiful woody, shrubby, uh, you know, most of the buckwheats are pretty low to the ground. This one gets quite tall and has these wonderful poofs of uh, yellow flowers, which eventually turn red with age. Um, I'm pretty sure exclusive to lava, lava cap. So the, the geology first and foremost determines what plants grow there. Um, and then all the other stuff is is just uh, impacting the geology in different ways. And so because of these volcanic mud flows that we are lucky enough to have at places like Hell's Half Acre and across the street at the Wildflower Ridge Trail, um, we get to experience this beautiful plant. And uh, another cool thing about the lava cap is because it's a volcanic 
uh, habitat, you get these brilliant uh, spring wildflower displays. You know, I like to call it like our our Table Mountain. Um, you know, everyone loves going to Table Mountain, Oroville, and that's volcanic uh, soils as well. You get um, sort of a a miniaturized version of that here, so to speak. And these this picture, this was not a particularly good blooming year. Um, you know, we had kind of weird weather and weird rains, early warm temperatures this year. So uh, it can be more brilliant than this, but you still get these gorgeous blooms um, all over Hell's Half Acre. And that included a little picture. There's my really dirty finger um, showing just how small this little uh, Githopsis is, little blue cup. So um, a lot of the stuff that um, I'm looking for is very, very, very tiny. Um, and we would call this like a belly plant, you know, because you have to get on your belly in order to view it up close. Uh, here's a really ornate Clarkia that grows on the lava caps here. It's a Clarkia Williamsonii, um, just pretty much including for its stunning beauty, these four-parted stigmas right here, which are quite hairy actually. And uh, over here showing it growing with the Pratt and Buckwheat, a very um, beautiful pastel late summer scene. Um, okay, we have Kellogg's Lewisia. Um, this one is also pretty much exclusively on lava caps. Here's the plants right here growing um, among some lupins. There's not a lot of vegetation, but a sort of a different kind of four-parted stigma right here. But uh, just a stunning, beautiful plant. This is a rare species as well. There's two subspecies, both are rare. And the interesting thing about the plants in our area is that they're actually intermediate between the two subspecies. So if you try to key it out, there's, I think, three characteristics and it has two of one and one of the other. And it, it's marked in the Jepson as being in need of further study. All right, so now we're on to riparian aquatic. Um, this is like pond streams, creeks, lake edges, and, and submerged plants. So we have like willows, cottonwoods, alders, button bush, spice bush, rushes, brushes, sedges, and pond weeds, uh, and cattails, that kind of thing. And so these are found all throughout the different uh, habitat types. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit because I see <laughs> how long I'm taking here. Um, all right, so Indian rhubarb, really common plant, um, sends up its flowers before the leaves. That's on the left here, has these beautiful rhizomes, which I don't even understand how these really get going, um, especially because uh, we have such raging rivers in the wintertime and the, the height of the water is just so variable, but these grip onto the rocks and uh, hold themselves in place and then make these really large um, umbrella-like -like leaves. We have two Pectiantia species, uh, Pectiantia breweri and Petranda, Pet, Pentandra. Um, the difference being the stamens, like these are, um, there's a stamen near each little antenna-like petal here. And uh, on the other one, the stamens are opposite of the petals. So they, or rather they're alternate with the petals. So it would be like petal, stamen, petal, stamen, that kind of thing. Uh, here's some of the riparian orchids, including the stream orchid, the white bog orchid, and the sparse flower rain orchid with its beautiful green flowers. Some of the shrubs that you'd find, are, um, you know, these two ericaceous, uh, rhododendron columbianum, the western Labrador tea, um, not so common around us, but definitely common on the coast, uh, and western azalea, one of my favorite smells in the plant kingdom, buttonbush, uh, absolutely covered in butterflies when in bloom, and two kinds of dogwood, uh, one that puts its flowers out before the leaves and one after the leaves. This is the black fruit at the bottom, and American dogwood, uh, creek dogwood, red osier dogwood, a lot of names for that one. Uh, here's a couple submerged plants. We have, uh, this is, believe it or not, this clover right here is not an actual clover. This is a fern. Um, it produces by spores. It exists submerged in the water for most of the year. Uh, and yeah, it's a floating aquatic fern that looks like a clover, just an absolutely bizarre plant. Um, we have the bog bean right here. This one grows submerged, sends these flowers, these really ornate hairy flowers uh, out of the water. It uh, eventually produces little like bean-like fruit, which is why it's called bog bean. And unbranched burr weed, uh, one of the few sporganium species that occur. This um, grows submerged as well. The leaves kind of float on the surface and then it sends its flowers up above and you have the, the male flowers up here with the pollen, female flowers below. Okay, granite outcrops. 
um, most of the plants here are growing in rock cracks or in substrates made of decomposed granite. Uh, you get things like the Sierra juniper, the lodgepole pine, huckleberry oak, pine mat, manzanita, pussy paws, uh, more areogonum species. That's going to be a recurring theme as we get higher and higher. Um, harlequin lupin shows up here quite a bit and uh, new penstemon species. Um, this is one of my favorite groups of plants. This is the Peleas, uh, the cliff breaks. And so you get three species that would occur in granite outcrops at the higher elevation. Uh, the one in the center, uh, the Sierra cliff break is pretty easy to tell apart with these really linear leaves, but these two look really similar. Um, and so to be able to tell them apart, the Pelea bridges the eye has uh, rounded leaves, which are actually folded over um, and, and, th and they're entire, they're, so they're not lobed. And then the Brewers has mo less folded leaves that are lobed um, so yeah, you kind of got to give them a close up look and it's very easy to confuse them. Okay. This is an incredible plant, a succulent, which can handle being buried under feet of snow. And then conversely in the opposite in the summer, it can deal with, you know, scorching heat and complete drought and just growing in these rocky areas. It's the, uh, Sierra stone crop and here's the flower here and quite a bit of color variation. These are all the same species. So it could be red, green, purple. Um, here's a different steer's head species. So this is the longhorn steer's head, pretty much known from granite. Uh, the other one being the shorthorn on serpentine. And uh, see how the horn of the steer's head here is, it starts splitting off much further up the flower and extends past the flower. And meanwhile, the other one, they were shorter and they kind of came out towards the tip of the flower. Another member of the poppy family, you're really lucky to see because they bloom right after the snow melt and they're gone within like two weeks or something. Uh, ericaceous plants of the higher elevations of rocky areas. Um, we have the purple mountain heather, kind of looks like rhododendron flowers that I'm used to coming from the East Coast. And then the beautiful, almost unreal looking bell shaped flowers of the Western moss heather. And here in the center is them growing together along with the vicinium species. So you got the ericaceous trifecta. Uh, here are two um, penstemon species that grow in these granite outcrops. Most penstemons uh, in this area are this like bluish purple color, but not these two. So they're pretty easy to recognize. The, excuse me, the mountain pride here uh, with its purple coloration, hairy corolla throat, and then the hot rock penstemon, penstemon ducis. Uh, with its really nice venation and quite quite small flowers. Um, these should be relatively easy to tell apart from the other penstemon, which certainly give me trouble. And then the very alien looking bud saxifrage in a, a totally different family, but uh, just, uh, yeah, very beautiful. Okay, fir forest. Um, you know, typically these are, when I'm saying Fir, I'm, I'm speaking about red fir, uh, the dominant tree there. There's very little in the understory in most places. Uh, it's very dense, um, relatively easy to recognize wood, uh, red fir by the, its tendency for wolf lichen to grow, this yellow lichen to grow um, on the trunks. And uh, this is some of our higher, highest elevation conifer forests. And you get uh, occasionally other shrubs like whitethorn, ceanothus, and snowbrush, and different ceanothus, uh, greenleaf manzanita. Scarlet gilia, Brewer's angelica, and various arnica species. Um, this is the double honeysuckle. It's probably my favorite honeysuckle. Uh, I like to joke around a lot and call it Shrekberry because of the uh, immature fruit right here. Kind of looks like that green ogre. Um, and actually produces two little purple flowers. And then the ovaries are fused. So the berries end up fused. And you can see on this right berry, there's the, uh, the point of attachment for the flowers at one point. So it kind of loses the little. Uh, little stalks there, but you can still tell it's a double. Uh, higher elevation lily, we have Lilium parvum, uh, the only lily in our area where the flowers point up towards the sky. So that one's pretty easy to tell, uh, a lily of wet places. And what do you know, another ericaceous uh, mycoheterotroph, the woodland pine drops, um, very common uh, in, in these pine forests, uh, very sticky and glandular and really gorgeous plant. And wouldn't you know it, it's a mycoheterotrophic fern. Um, it's the leathery grape fern, Subtridium multifidum. So this uh, 
actually it has a relationship with soil fungi as well, despite the fact that it's being, uh, despite the fact that it's a fern. And uh, really interesting for having two kinds of fronds. You have the infertile frond right here, which kind of looks uh, pretty typically like a fern and frond, uh, fern frond. <laughs> And here is the fertile fern right here, which I've provided a close-up of and where the great fern comes from. Um, really, really fascinating form. We have the monk's hood in the buttercup family, uh, multiple flower parts there. The, um, the stigmas and the, sti uh, and the pistils are rising up into the top of the hood there. And the side view really shows why it's been given the common name monk's hood. Okay, meadows. Um, I absolutely love meadows. Uh, they're probably one of my favorite habitats. I've spent a lot of time in them this year. Um, and so you'll typically find things like willows, certainly the graminoids, the rushes, the grasses, the sedges. Uh, corn lily is very common. Sometimes you'll find entire meadows made of just corn lily. Uh, the meadow penstemon, which you can actually see in the foreground over here. Um, Bistort is really common, and long-stalked clover um, is pretty often found on the edges of those. Uh, this right here is our kamas lily. Um, beautiful, you know, kamasia growing in our meadows, higher elevations. I have heard reports of actually it occurs down in Grass Valley, but I have yet to confirm that. That would be really bizarre. Um, and a white form that I found this year. The elephant's head. So this one's related to the Indian warrior or, you know, warrior's plume, excuse me, that we saw earlier. And uh, again, just an amazing common name because see the elephant right here? You got the ears, the head, the trunk. Uh, another par hemiparasitic plant grows in meadows, uh, tapping into nearby plants. Um, it's a really gorgeous one to see out there. And then the little elephant's head. My slide would move. There we go. Um, the little elephant's head, again, uh, looks like a little elephant. The trunk is kind of pointed up a little bit, like it's holding its uh, trunk, trying to be threatening to a leopard or something like that. Uh, and then in the picture on the left side, you can see these are the, uh, this is that same plant, but in seed. So all of these little dark stalks that are running through this meadow here. Uh, Porterella carnosula. So this is um, a monotypic genus. So it's the only species in the genus Porterella. Uh, grows in the drying margins of wet areas uh, like meadows, for instance. Um, can only really be confused with Downingia species, but uh, examining the fruits pretty much um, splits the two species apart. Really gorgeous plant, though. And then a couple random things from the meadows. We have. Um, Beautiful pincushion plant, a Navarretia. I'm not actually sure which one this is, but I wanted to include it because these leaves are just amazing coming off of there. Um, Erythranthi primuloides, the primrose uh, monkey flower with a little rosette of leaves, a very long flower stalk, and then these gorgeous yellow flowers. Uh, marsh marigold over here in the buttercup family, and a rose family member, um, the pine woods uh, horkelia, horkelia fusca, fusca. Subalpine areas, we end up getting things like the western white pine and the mountain hemlock. Uh, sage brushes are really common out here. Uh, Stragglers species and, and paintbrush diversity cert certainly picks up a little bit, at least for the first time since the grasslands. Um, one of the best buckwheats in the world. This is lobes buckwheat, Ariagonum lobii, growing out of rock cracks, really distinct for laying its uh, flowers down on the ground and uh, these really wide spoon shaped hairy leaves and the hairs are just so that it can deal with the fact that it's getting constant sun um, in those really exposed areas. And here's uh, some high elevation monkey flowers. We have a beautiful stand of Tilling's monkey flower, uh, which is a, it looks a lot like the seep spring monkey flower that's really common all over the area, but this one actually produces rhizomes and spreads that way. And one thing that I've noticed that I've never seen documented um, is that it has a very, uh, very, like mucus-like feel to the leaves, almost like Erythranthi muschiata, um, where, yeah, if you feel the foliage, especially when it's really young, it leaves like a slime on your fingers. Uh, and that's one way, and that's lacking on the guitata, um, on the seed spring one. And then over here, blushing monkey flower, uh, Erythranthi iridescent, uh, really gorgeous high elevation monkey flower, and even found a white version of that as well, up here in the corner. Um, mountain bog gentian, um, 
really, really beautiful bell-shaped flowers, really ornate in the center there. Um, several little dots on the edge of the petals as well, and just a really beautiful form. One thing I really liked about this is when the buds were forming, the, the flowers were like dark black um, and then eventually turned to that blue color. I'm going to run through a couple quickly. This is Castilea pruinosa, kind of looking like a sea anemone. And uh, tooth owl's clover, and these two are in the same family over here, Orthocarpus custodatus, uh, really geometrically interesting plant there. And then um, Epilobium ocridatum, the rock fringe, um, very large flower for a uh, willow herb. Uh, alpine, these are our highest elevations. There's little vegetation, as you can see up there, um, but it exists. And a lot of them are uh, dwarf. Um, you know, if they exist elsewhere, they're smaller because they have to deal with high winds and um, that kind of thing. So you get more Areogonum species, alpine sorrel, alpine lady fern, probably one of my favorite ferns, uh, pussy toes, alpine bed straw, alpine gentian, and sky pilot. Um, here is Ipomopsis congesta. This is the ball head Ipomopsis. Um, really beautiful kind of mound forming. Uh, Ipomopsis and grows low to the ground with these clusters of um, of flowers, and this is related to like the scarlet uh, Ipomopsis. And um, there's another one that the name's escaping me. Slender tube skyrocket. There we go. Uh, but those all both grow quite tall um, and have like singular flowers, as opposed to this cluster. Really interesting um, foliage on those as well. We have uh, a couple more aphylin. This is the same aphylin that we saw, the same species rather, but you can see it's, it looks very different than that other one we saw um, at the lower elevations growing on the phacelia. This one's likely growing on artemisia roots or, or one of the other shrubs nearby. So uh, there were no phacelias nearby for this to grow off of. So this is what is likely going to be like, in a, in a couple of years, there will probably be two different species, I, I imagine. Uh, really, really interesting version of that. And then the flat top broom rape, the aphylin corymbosum, right here, where it has, instead of just a single flowering stalk, uh, it has uh, many flowers all attached at the top, or all attached and mainly growing actually below ground here. And these are both parasitic plants as well. Uh, this next plant was on my bucket list for, and I was able to find it this year. Um, thanks, Ray Lynn, I think you're here. Uh, <laughs> and so this is the Arctic willow. So you can see my hand right here. That's as tall as this willow gets. Um, it is absolutely a true willow, but it only grows four inches tall, maybe. And uh, willows are all dioecious, which means they have separate male and female individuals. So we have the male over here with the, the stamens and the pollen and all that. And then the females over here with their little forked stigmas. So very cool plant. So happy to have seen it. Um, we have the beautiful Sierra primrose. Uh, these really thick leathery leaves growing in rosettes, a little bit of a woody base, and these um, pin and thrum flowers here. Uh, really interesting flower morphology that I don't have time to get into right now. But um, in any case, my first time seeing it was this year uh, after obviously reading about it quite a bit and just never being able to get high enough in elevation at the right time to see it. And the first time I saw it, it existed in populations like this over here on the right. Just a really stunning stand. And all right, we're getting close to the end here. We got mountain chaparral. Uh, this is very different communities than the low elevation chaparral, it's, but it's certainly shrub dominated. Uh, you do get gooseberries and currants and green leaf manzanita instead of the white leaf. Um, I often find like Western peony growing there and various species of woodland stars. Uh, certainly one of the most dominant plants there is this one. It's the woolly mules here, Swyathea mollus. Um, and also happened to find this really, really cool variegated one where like half of the leaf was, uh, was pale colored there. Uh, Hydrophyllum capitatum. Oh, we have a couple hydrophyllum species around here. This one is unique for having its flowers uh, held along the ground below the leaves. So if you want to, if you want to check out those flowers, you got to lay in your stomach and push all the leaves aside. Uh, it goes by the common name woolen breeches, which I don't really understand, but it's fun to say. Uh, here's Lecklin's mariposa lily, Calicordus lecklinii, um, probably one of our less ornate.
Shane, we can no longer hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear better? you now. Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Uh, how do I get back? All right, well, you're just gonna have to see my toolbar there, I guess. Um, so, oh, there we go. Minor technical glitch, everyone. I beg your, your patience. So I'm, uh, I'll back up um, and just talk about this slide again from the beginning. Um, so yeah, weird color morph, uh, purple coloration that I thought was possibly a different species when I first saw it because I was not expecting to see a purple uh, calicordis like lineae. And uh, this was a couple of people got in contact with me um, when I posted it on social media saying that they had been uh, f photographing and searching for calicordis for decades and they'd never seen this before. So I felt pretty special um, to find this one. And it just kind of like, I was just walking along and it appeared directly in front of me. It was not something I saw from a distance. I almost nearly stepped on it. So there were just two individuals that had this coloration. Okay, and we are finally at our last uh, habitat type. This is the east side scrublands. Uh, it's much more arid. You get the encroachment of desert plants from Nevada, um, move their way in. If you're lucky, you might see something like desert peach growing at our easternmost areas. Um, it is shrub and herbaceous dominated, uh, and you'll see things like artemisia or bitterbrush, uh, astragalus, castilea, that kind of thing, um, including this, one of my favorite members of the aster family. This is uh, Canactus deglossii. Uh, on the left, you can see the, the many different color forms on one plant, um, and it just has these discoid flowers. So it, it's, uh, even though it's in the sunflower family, it lacks all of the ray flowers that, uh, you know, what we would think of as like petals. And instead, you can see really closely here that, that it's a, a composite of multiple, multiple flowers, each with its own little curly Q stigma there. Um, all right, uh, a wonderful thistle, Circium scariosum, the elk thistle, uh, remarkable for never getting taller than this. It grows this rosette and then puts its flower out right in the middle of the rosette. It does not get tall and branchy like the other one. And uh, it has these really cool star-shaped flowers, which the beetles really seem to love. Uh, and another thistle here uh, is the snowy thistle. This is Circium occidentale, specifically the variety Candidissimum. Um, and snowy thistle is pretty apropos, I would say. It looks uh, it's like bright white, um, very, very, very tomatose. And so, uh, again, like ha hairy, um, this tomatosity is uh, a strategy to prevent the harsh light of the sun from damaging the plant tissues. And we, we get some really beautiful uh, lupinous lepidus um, stands. This one is actually, it's a low growing uh, relative of the Yerba Santa, Eridictian lobii, called woolly nama, because it used to be in the genus nama. Um, and actually, you might hear about it being placed back in nama pretty soon, including being moved to its own family, Nemaceae. Um, saw a paper on that recently, so that might be coming down the pipeline. And then a nice little habitat shot showing some artemisia and some curly mountain mahogany, um, really beautiful plants. And so uh, the overwhelming message is, even though we just went through a ton of different plants and a ton of different habitats, we have so much more to learn about what grows here. Um, we've only scratched the surface. There's many places that have not been visited in decades. Um, there's new species to tease out where, uh, you know, someone in the 1800s said we have this species and now it's been split into multiple species and we don't know necessarily. There's rumors of hundreds and hundreds of plants that we've never formally collected and so uh, it's one of the things that keeps me really motivated to um, just keep exploring, keep getting out in the woods and uh, learn as much as I can about Nevada and Placer counties. And so thanks for attending everyone. And thanks again to Hannah Kang for those vernal pool photos that were beautiful. And feel free to reach out and contact me. And uh, you know, I'm on the, the Facebook group, the Redbud Facebook group fairly often, um, you know, send me a message, make some posts on there. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right.
Chrissy, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Shane. Well, we had a couple Oh, I can't. I can't hear you, Chrissy. You're breaking up. About uh, some specific uh, slides. Um, Alan wanted to know. I uh, got <clears throat> got kicked out of where I was, so I'm going to. I'm I'm outside of it, so hopefully all my audio will come through well enough. Uh, so You're much better now. Okay, good. So uh, on the two Octostaphylus, the Visita and the Miwaka. Yeah. Um, Alan wanted to know if the stems look different as well in terms of differentiating between the two species. I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Her, her audio is going. He, Alan wanted to know on the two. Stems look different in the two species? Where the, <laughs> on, on the. Uh, can't hear you, Chrissy, you're breaking up. And the Archocephalus viscida. Oh, I, uh, I'm gonna try, well, okay, let me try something else. Okay. <laughs> is, well, here, in the meantime, this, I'll answer, is this, oh, go ahead. Is this, is this better? Okay, is, and the Archocephalus yes. miwaka and the Archocephalus viscida, are this, do the stems look different between the two species as well? No, um, okay. yeah, it's they're pretty much they look almost exactly the same when there's not flowers or fruit. Um, mm -hmm. The leaves of Miwaka are slightly bigger and slightly more rounded on average, but it's not um, it's not reliable. It's not a reliable characteristic. It's really you need you really need to examine flowers. Um, you know, start next time in January, February, when those manzanitas start going, take a closer look at those flowers because um, that's the time to get it in. Wonderful. Okay. I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. I will be out there looking at them. Okay. <laughs> and so will Alan, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> so he had another question. Uh, let's see. On the Streptanthus, uh, he wanted to know, did you take those pictures with your clip, le with your clip lens? Uh, I guess you must have had some really close-up pictures. And he wanted to know how you took those. Yes. So especially, uh, I think it was the polygaloides one, the purple flowered one. That's with my um, my clip-on lens. And uh, how I take them is pretty much holding my breath and trying not to move as much as possible um, and double-checking my photographs before I leave. So a, a lot of the time I'll take like five, six, seven photographs. Um, and then when I get home, um, go through them and try to find like the one that actually turned out in focus. And, you know, one of the detriments of those clip-on lenses, is you, really, you really only only get one plane in focus. So if you're, and you're looking at a 3D object. So um, sometimes uh, you only get the very front of the flower, but everything behind it is blurry and um, just kind of have to roll with the punches a little bit. But yeah, I, my answer is, is generally just like hold my breath and pray that it came out. And then take lots of photographs, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. There's there's no such thing. You know, a typical outing for me is like 200 to 300 photographs. Um, easy. Um, and that's because I posted on iNaturalist. There's no such thing as too much, too many photographs, especially if you're trying to identify something. But certainly there's such a thing as too little photographs. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I've come home from a day out and found out that even though I took seven or eight photographs, I'm missing a photograph of that one part, which would help me get to the species level. That happens quite a bit, actually. Well, I don't feel so badly hearing that, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> I have regretted taking too few photographs many more times than I have regretted saying, oh, why did I spend so much time doing photography? I've never felt exactly. it that way. Never felt <laughs> it. I'm sure you haven't either. OK, uh, so let's see. Um, Oh, Louise had a, has a wonderful question. What flowers would you expect to see in recent burn areas if there's a large burn area? I'm sure it depends 
on the on the habitat and the plant community. But what comes to mind for you, Shane? That's right. Yeah. Um, so what comes to mind for me is largely the fire adapted species. So things like yerba santa, um, manzanitas, cenothis, um, you know, the McNabb cypress that I mentioned. Um, but unfortunately, in this day and age, what I expect to see in a lot of these areas are, are massive amounts of invasive species. Um, specifically, one that comes to mind is the woolly mullen. Um, you know, that is uh, dependent on a disturbance regime. It uh, can lay, if seeds can lay dormant in the soil for 100 years, I mean, they've germinated woolly mullein seeds after 1,300 years being buried in the soil. Um, and so, and it just makes so much seed uh, that I fully expect, like, for instance, in the Jones fire scar, that there's going to be a ton of mullein that comes up. Um, and, you know, granted, as the forest succession uh, occurs over time, it's going to shade out the mullein, which typically needs um, full sun. But, you know, in that time, it will have basically muddied up the, the seed bank so much that any time it burns or any time it's disturbed or opened up at this point, it's going to just continue to come back. Uh, and certainly uh, invasive grasses uh, is the same deal. I mean, that's one of the problems that we have now. We used to do um, cultural burning, controlled burning um, a lot more. But until the modern age, we didn't have to worry about invasive species coming back. We'd regenerate the land and it would be native species that came back. Uh, but now we have these really quick acting invasive species and they're tolerant of serpentine and they're tolerant of gabbro and they will just move on and take it over. So really um, it's, it's less of a panacea solution um, than we think. Right, I think of that as being one of the issues is that a lot of these areas have not burned since the invasive species became uh, so pervasive. And so this will be the first post burn period for a lot of these areas uh, when they've been so susceptible to the invasives. Yes, exactly. And I, you know, I can point exactly to, you know, having been up in the, uh, I alluded to going to the campfire scar uh, mm -hmm. in, in, I was in the Feather River Canyon in Plumas County and uh, where that fire had run through, it's solid fields of broom. Oh. Um, yeah, the broom just immediately colonizes those burned areas. So it's rather unfortunate to see. Uh, it's kind of daunting, in fact. But uh, yeah, here's to hoping things will be a little bit better here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and Ray Lynn uh, noticed that uh, bush lupin, is, uh, it excels after fire. It's one of those. A fire adapted species that does very well and comes back easily. Excellent. Um, uh, Brad, Brad is curious, what's the type of clip-on lens you have? You should also mention the oh, kind of, of, of smart, uh, smartphone you have, you know, in terms of what kind of operating system you have so that people understand that. Sure. Um, well, I've got a, a Samsung uh, Galaxy S9 that I use. Um, that's my, my cell phone. Um, it, I actually purchased this phone specifically for the camera capabilities. So it was something that I wanted. Um, I wanted to be able to take really good pictures. I needed a new cell phone anyway. I had enough money for either a good camera or a phone. So I went for the best, uh, the best camera on a phone I could possibly get. And uh, this is my clip-on lens right here. It's from a company called Black Eye. So it just clips onto the, the phone. Um, purchased it on Amazon. I think it was like $10 or something like that. Um, wow. $10. So yeah, really, really good investment. Yeah. And it, and it works and, uh, on, on, on any smartphone, right? This one specifically. So this is one that actually took me a while. Is This one is, is quite long till the lens comes in. And so this, uh, my Samsung, the, uh, the, the uh, camera is quite far down. So I know like iPhones have the camera like way up at the top. So if I got one for a iPhone, it wouldn't reach my camera. Uh, right, so, so I had to get one that's extra long. Okay, so you get the clip-on lens that fits with the form factor for your smartphone. Right. Okay, yes. good to know, very good to know. Yes, we hate to make a mistake. So here's a question, what's the best yeah. way to get started on keying natives, or what's it, what are some good ways to get started on keying natives? Sure, great right? question. Yeah, I would say start with the native plants that are in your backyard 
and you have access to and start with plants that you already know um, that you can identify just from just all, just from looking at it. Because if you take that and you work down the key, then it's really hard to get confused by terminology you don't understand. Um, it, you know, you'll see, you have a, a starting point and end point and you can follow the key down the entire way. And it's a good way of like just diving into, I mean, the, the nomenclature is immense. Uh, it's really, really difficult to work with a lot of the time. And so if you're doing a key and you're like, what do they mean by staminode? And there's not a picture that shows what that is, um, you know, by going through and I, and keying out plants you already know, uh, you get a lot more experience. And then it's just, just keep doing it, you know, just do it over time. Um, Cause especially when I first started keying plants and, and you know, and being self-taught, not having a lot of these tips available to me is um, I would get to a, a couple steps down the key and just get stuck because uh, I didn't understand what it was asking for uh, because I didn't um, know what, uh, or I didn't have the right parts. So like, it'll say like uh, it, a split will be over the, the fruits and I'm looking at it in flower. And so yeah. all I would do is kind of get that in my head and be like, okay, well, next time I want to identify this, make sure you get the fruits as well. And over time, you start knowing what to look for and what is going to be, it's, it's really like a practice, practice, practice kind of thing. Right. And, and there is in the, am I right that in the, in the new edition of the Red Bud Wildflower book, there is a key, correct? There's a key to, to families in there, which is really excellent. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. I, I cheated a little bit uh, and didn't learn families uh, at first. Like I, I and because my knowledge base is largely based in the red bud area, I could cut out a lot of uh, information. So um, I sometimes go out with, with botanists who have like a really, really good broad knowledge of plants throughout like say North America or something. And I could look at a plant and identify it because the Rolodex that I have to go through in order to say like, this is uh, white fur or red fur is a lot smaller than people who have this much larger knowledge base. And they have to like rule all these things out, remember where they are in, <laughs> in the state or in the country. Um, so it's a benefit and a, and, a, and a disadvantage as well, because then when I go out to like SoCal, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> right. I have to go back to family level keys yeah. and start um, from the beginning. Yeah, heaven, yeah, heaven for fend, you would go to Bryce or Zion or the East Coast. You'd be like, whoa, where am I? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but uh, at the same time, because I'm, I'm dealing with like a, a, a narrow slice of the species by concentrating in this area, I could recognize certain family characteristics that much faster because I didn't right. have a whole bunch of variation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, a blessing and a curse, basically. Right. It sounds and, like uh, I'm always trying to learn more and always trying to expand my knowledge and get a better understanding. Um, but it's one of the things about um, not going through your typical botany educational route that, uh, yeah, that I, I skipped over. Well, that's okay. Most mm -hmm. of us will skip that over, too. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you do your field trips, do you... Um, occasionally stop at a plant and 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 go through the keying out process so people I mean maybe not completely but in, in some compact form or not um, well so far you know unfortunately we had planned this really big field trip schedule for this year and then uh, yeah. the pandemic happened so we had to cancel it uh, one of the field trips we were planning on doing was going to be largely a keying field trip. Like I wanted to do a training on like, let's pick out a couple plants and let's work our way through the keys and try to figure out what we have here. Mm -hmm. um, so that never ended up happening. Uh, the best that we've done so far is essentially we'll, we'll walk around and I'll, I'll stop and ramble about a plant for five minutes or so and talk about what would be in the key, but not actually have people running through the keys. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to. In in that in that COVID free future, yes, yes, can't come soon enough. Absolutely. And then, um, are there any trails or other locations with plants um, that are labeled in some way so we could expand on what we saw here, so we could see living plants that have labels? Now that's true yeah. at um, 
at, on the buttermilk trail, correct? At that's, Yuba? The, that's the one I was going to bring up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, during the spring, uh, they do wonderful wildflower. I lost my sound. Or you lost your sound. One of us lost our sound. Oh, let's see you. Yeah, every once in a while, I seem to be getting muted for no reason. But anyway, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Yeah, uh, yeah Buttermilk Bend Trail, uh, there's labels. I've actually joked with some of the Dawsons that they've taken the fun out of it for me by labeling everything there. But uh, but yeah, it's great. An another thing you can go if you want to see labeled plants is botanical garden. Um, you know, pretty much every specimen in a botanical garden is going to be labeled. Um, so that helps. Yeah, there's not a too there's not too many that are are labeled like that. But the beauty is you can go on iNaturalist and you can look at pretty much anywhere, mm -hmm. um, and zoom in on the plants there, and you can see pictures of those plants with uh, you know expert verified identification. And there's been so many times where I go out to a place I've never been before, I'll look at it on iNaturalist first, and then when I get there, I go, that's that plant. You know, that's the one I saw in a, as a picture. So do you um, do so, you yeah. do you say on our naturals do you say I'm going to this place and then it gives you a list of the plants that have been identified for that place? Is that where you're um so I, I typically use the, the smartphone app and I'll go to the yes. explore section and then it okay. just gives you a map and then you can zoom in the map to wherever you're gonna be going and a button appears that's like search within the map area. Oh cool. Very cool. I, I have no, I will admit, I haven't used iNaturals as much as I should. And I, and it's like one of my, okay, when I can start getting out after COVID, this is one of the things that I'm going to do. Um, oh, so Alan has a question that's related to, oh, oh, somebody says also, as long as we're on the same subject, that the Tilden Botanical Garden in Berkeley has a great foothill section, which is all native plants. So those would be that. Okay. Go so, check it out when you can travel, folks. Yeah. So it's it's two o'clock. Let's take a quick break. Let people leave if they want to. But if people want to stick around, uh, I'll stay and answer as many questions as there as there are. Yeah. And we thank everybody for coming. It's just been absolutely terrific to have such a wonderful turnout for Shane's presentation. Yes, thank you, everyone. Very cool to see. Yeah. And let me just hear for a moment, just while people are leaving, uh, put up, I'm just putting up the slide. I think I shared my screen. Have I shared my screen? Do people see? Not yet. Word? Okay. Oh, well, let me go share my screen. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, while you're doing that, I'll make a point. Um, someone mentioned the the purple flowered Streptanthus being uh, Streptanthus purpurescens and not po polygaloides. Um, and yes, that's uh, true. A paper was published that the uh, purple flowered com compressed uh, serpentine dwelling uh, Streptanthus are actually Streptanthus purpurescens. Um, and the lower elevation greenish yellow flowered ultramafic dwelling Streptanthus are the ones that are still polygaloides. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to mention that I'm aware of that, but it hasn't made its way to Egypt since, so I haven't quite adopted it yet. And I didn't want to confuse people by throwing out a, a, a species that you can't, you can't Google yet. You can't find anything about. So uh, somebody asks, do you have a recommendation for a relatively inexpensive, inexpensive microscope for plant ID purposes? And then there's a related question. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, answer that one, then we'll get to the related question. Okay, relatively inexpensive microscope yeah. for plants. Yeah, I would say there's, there's three levels of microscopes that uh, are really useful for this kind of thing. Um, I have a, I think it's called a Celestron or Celestron. It's a digital scope uh, with a USB cord, plugs into my computer. It uses the computer as your screen and it magnifies not, it doesn't magnify very much at all. But one of the benefits is I can take a picture um, instantly, a really good quality picture, uh, or I can take video. 
So I, I took like picture or I took videos of like aphids uh, recently, like walking around on, underneath the, the microscope. Uh, and that's actually really good for a lot of plant identification because you're looking at plant features, which are small, but not microscopic. So, you know, you, you could typically, if you were to use a hand lens to figure out, uh, to tease out some of these things, you could use that scope and, you know, they sell them for like $75 or something like that. Um, I also have at my dissection scope. I'm going to just quickly check the brand name on it. Is an AM scope. Uh, <laughs> so that is, that really blew my, my, my world. Yep. 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 Shane. Shane, you, you are now muted again. Shane, you're muted again. No, no sound. No. Nope. Is it back? Okay. Yeah, I don't know why that keeps happening, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we'll hear you. Uh, so yeah, the AM scope, um, you know, magnifies uh, a lot more, um, and I can see. Uh, I posted like some pictures of seeds that I, I took recently uh, where I just literally shot uh, um, photos through the eyepiece of the camera, but uh, it does not take good photographs, uh, for instance. So it's really good for me and for my understanding of things, but there's no way to really share that information. Um, and then currently I'm in the market for a compound scope, which would allow me to really get down in the nitty gritty, um, you know, I get, um, magnify up to 500 times because uh, I've got an interest in the bryophytes and the mosses. And to do anything with mosses, you pretty much need a compound scope. Um, so I'm in the process of, of researching and purchasing one of those right now. Um, but the, the AMP scope was, is, you know, I could recommend that one. Uh, it worked really well for me. The, the Celestron digital scope works really well for me. Um, you know, if you're not necessarily doing this work professionally, I think you can, you can deal with a, a mid-level scope like that. I hope that answers the question. Somebody wanted to know, is there any place or are there any times and, you know, events when people could get practice using a dissection scope? I think when we have had members, memberships, when Red Letters had membership celebrations in person, we, uh, members have brought dissection scopes and uh, scopes that attach to computers. They brought them so that people can see through them, correct? Yeah, that's true. Um, that, that's a good way um, to do it. I actually got, I cut my teeth with a dissection scope by uh, volunteering with the Sierra Streams Institute um, mm -hmm. here in Grass Valley. They have a macroinvertebrate lab. Um, un unfortunately, they were really badly impacted by the Jones fire. So I, I think yeah. it might be a while before it's up and running again. Um, but in any case, you, you basically, um, they give you a vial of what's essentially river scum. Uh, <laughs> and you pick through it and you count all of the macroinvertebrate larvae. Uh, and separate them out into a separate vial. And then they have some real experts who will identify those to family or species, and they use it to um, to monitor river health because one of the first things that's in, in, uh, impacted is the uh, the insect larvae that, that live in the rivers. Um, so that, that was one of the things when I had that experience, I was like, I need to get a microscope because it was just so much fun. We'd go, uh, both my wife and I, and we'd, uh, you know, look through the scopes and hang out with the, you know, really cool and, and nerdy science types that, uh, you know, volunteer and, and work with SSI. And so I can't recommend that enough. Um, also, you know, there's, uh, I think CMPS does uh, identification classes. I know um, there's a, a, a grass identification class that I really want to take up at UC Chico that's open to the public. So you just kind of got to put your feelers out and try to um, find out who's offering these opportunities, and they're they're out there, definitely. That's wonderful. Uh, I think that takes care of all the questions. Well, let me just do one last little review. Sure, uh, I'll say oh. to Alan. Yes, this this video will be on our YouTube channel. Um, pretty much as soon as this is done with, it should be up there, so you can watch it again or review it or share it out. We'd love that.
and it'll be on the same place as where you went to get the Zoom information for this program. That's where yeah, on our website. Find them. yeah. So that'll be a link uh, to the place on the on the YouTube channel. So however it works for you. Uh, Luis wanted to know um, in that post burn scenario that we talked about, what flowers one would be likely to see. Uh, what flowers? Yeah. Um, you well, know. you know, it, it, I'm pretty sure, much again, the same ones I said before. The Yerba Santa and Manzanita, um, you know, they certainly are the ones that, that I associate most with like a fire interval. Um, I'm sure if I really thought about it, <laughs> I could come up right, with more. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that pretty much takes care of it uh, for all the questions. So this has Great. been terrific, Shane. Thank you so much. And thank, you know, thanks for imparting such information and such, oh my gosh, you know, just feel, and I'm sure everybody feels so filled with all of the beautiful images that you shared with us, as well as the information, and then staying to answer everybody's questions. Thanks so much, Shane. Yeah, of course. And I just want to extend the invitation again, you know, to reach out to me. I'm always happy to nerd out about plants. Um, you know, never mind that. So, uh, yeah, get in touch if you want to chat and, more. Yeah, and let me just remind everybody that we do have our Red Bud meeting, our chapter meeting on Zoom on Wednesday, uh, September 16th at 7 o'clock. And that's where we'll uh, conclude and announce the winners of the Red Bud Treasure Hunt Bingo. And we'll have Leslie Warren's presentation on advocacy and conservation on Thursday, September 17th at seven o'clock. And we'll have my presentation on uh, what makes gardening with natives special next Saturday on September 19th at noon. And the login inf information for each of these is on our website uh, and on Facebook. And thank you, Shane. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. We hope to see everybody else then. Okay. Bye, all.